Welcome to the latest installment in the speaker series of the Hoover Institution's project on China's global sharp power. I am Glenn Tiffert, manager of the project and a research fellow here at Hoover. Today, we have an outstanding event featuring Matt Pottinger, who has joined Hoover recently as a distinguished visiting fellow and a contributor to our project on China's global sharp power. From 2019 to 2021, Matt served as Deputy National Security Advisor to the President of the United States, and before that, as Senior Director for Asia on the National Security Council. Earlier, he was a Beijing-based reporter for Reuters and for the Wall Street Journal, and served three tours as a U.S. Marine deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. Matt has been a pivotal figure and guiding hand in the recent recalibration of American policy towards China, and few are therefore better placed to reflect on the future of US-China relations. We are delighted that Matt chose our project to make his public debut at Hoover and know that we will benefit from his counsel. Following Matt's remarks, Hoover Senior Fellows Elizabeth Economy and H.R. McMaster will join him in a brief discussion, and then we will take questions for Matt from the audience. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Matt, welcome, and the floor is yours. Hey, Glenn, thanks so much. And uh, thanks to HR uh, and to Liz, also uh, Larry Diamond for hosting me today. Uh, thanks also to Dr. Condoleezza Rice uh, for her leadership uh, uh, with uh, such a strong team uh, at the Hoover Institution. Uh, you know, really, during my four years at the White House, uh, the Hoover Institution really distinguished itself as one of the one of the few uh, think tanks uh, that consistently published uh, creative, bold, uh, and truly independent research and recommendations related to China. So I'm very proud uh, to have recently joined Hoover. Uh, tomorrow marks the 50 days. Uh, uh, since President Biden was sworn into office. So I thought I'd focus my prepared marks today on uh, first Beijing's current approach to the United States, uh, my take on President Biden's approach so far toward China, uh, and what it all means for the US business community. And I'll, I'll close with a couple of thoughts about the mindset that I believe America should, should adopt uh, as a government and as a people to ensure that we win the competition against Beijing's vision for a pre predominantly authoritarian world. It's a competition that we very much can and very much must uh, win. And I'll, I'll try to be succinct so that we have plenty of time for a lively discussion. So what's Beijing's approach? Uh, in the weeks that surrounded President Biden's inauguration, Chinese leaders waged an information campaign aimed at the United States. Uh, the flurry of speeches and letters and announcements was not, as news reporters first assumed, addressed mainly at the new administration in Washington. It was actually an influence operation targeting the U.S. business community. The Communist Party's top diplomat, Yang Jiechi, spoke to a virtual audience of American business leaders and uh, former officials uh, in early February. And he painted a rosy picture of investment and trade opportunities in China before warning that Tibet and Xinjiang, where human rights atrocities are underway, Hong Kong, where the rule of law is being dismantled, and Taiwan, which Beijing has threatened to annex by force, are, quote, red lines, close quote. Uh, he made clear that Americans of all walks of life uh, would do well to keep their mouths shut about these issues. Uh, Young excoriated Trump administration policies towards China, and he was unsubtle in pressing his audience to lobby the Biden administration to reverse them. Uh, other senior Chinese diplomats made similar statements aimed at U.S. business people, and General Secretary Xi Jinping, seated before a mural of the Great Wall of China, beamed himself to business elites in Davos in late January. Uh, he used his speech to enlist their support in resisting efforts by European and American policymakers to decouple segments of their economies from China's. Uh, General Secretary Xi even wrote a personal letter to a prominent US businessman exhorting him to quote, make active efforts to promote China US economic and trade cooperation. Now, in order to make clear that these were requirements by Beijing and not mere su suggestions, uh, Beijing squirted a shot of vinegar in, in the form of sanctions uh, that it announced on nearly 30 current or former uh, U.S. government officials. 
Uh, and these were on top of sanctions that Beijing had already placed on American human rights activists, pro-democracy foundations, and some United States senators last year. So Beijing's intended message is, if you want to do business in China, it must be at the expense of American values. You must meticulously ignore atrocities inside China's borders. You must disregard that Beijing uh, has reneged on its major promises, including its international treaty guaranteeing Hong Kong uh, a high degree of autonomy. And you must stop engaging with national security minded officials in your own capital, unless it's to lobby them on Beijing's behalf. So the mistake, this unmistakable ultimatum for Beijing is you have to choose, you have to choose. Now, there's another notable element in Beijing's approach uh, to its, uh, and that's really its explicit aspiration to make the world permanently dependent on China's manufacturing base, even as Beijing pursues independence from high-tech exports by European and American companies. So in other words, decoupling is precisely Beijing's strategy, so long as it's entirely on Beijing's terms. Beijing also has a deliberate strategy to remain the largest market for fungible commodities. Uh, so just let that sink in for a minute. China's top leader has stated plainly that he's pursuing a grand strategy of making China independent of high-tech goods and services from advanced industrialized countries, while simultaneously making those same countries heavily reliant on China for its high-tech supplies, for their high-tech supplies, uh, and also as a market for commodities. So what's even more remarkable is that the Communist Party is no longer hiding why it is pursuing this strategy. In, in a speech that Xi delivered early last year, but published only in November in the party's leading theoretical journal, she said that China, quote, must tighten international production chains dependence on China with the aim of forming powerful countermeasures and deterrent capabilities. So this phrase, powerful countermeasures and deterrent capabilities is Communist Party jargon for offensive leverage. So Beijing's grand strategy is to accumulate and exert economic leverage to coerce its political, uh, coerce uh, uh, people into uh, adopting its political aims around the world. And I'll, I'll give you a recent example of that. Uh, after cultivating very significant trade volumes with Australia over the years, Beijing last year suddenly began restricting imports of Australian wine, beef, and barley for purely political aims. Uh, Beijing rele released a list of 14 quote unquote disputes uh, in actuality, it was a list of political demands of the Australian government, and the demands included uh, Australia having to roll back its laws designed to counter China's uh, covert influence operations in, in Australian politics and society. And it also included a, a demand that Australia muzzle Australia's free press to prevent it from publishing news articles that are critical of the regime in Beijing. So Australia's travails are really just a foretaste of what Beijing has in store for all of us if we fail to rise to the challenge. Now, what about Washington's approach to China? Uh, President Biden last week published his interim national security strategic guidance. So this is a 24 page document summarizing President Biden's uh, priorities. And the document makes clear that as far as challenges to the United States go, China is really in a category by itself. It is, quote, the only competitor potentially capable of combining its economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to mount a sustained challenge to a stable and open international system uh, that, that, is, that document states. Uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken in his first major address, which was time for the release of this strategic guidance, went further, uh, describing the relationship with China as, quote, the biggest geopolitical test of the 21st century. And Secretary Blinken said that, quote, our relationship with China will be competitive when it should, be collaborative when it can be, and adversarial when it must. Uh, he went out of his way to differentiate the Biden administration's approach from the softer policy of the Obama years. Uh, but most striking of all, I think, uh, about that document is the degree to which 
uh, it casts the US-China competi competition in ideological terms. So the document dwells on this theme quite a bit. Uh, in his signed letter introducing the document, President Biden said, quote, I believe we are in the midst of a historic and fundamental debate about the future direction of our world. There are those who argue that given all the challenges we face, autocracy is the best way forward. Uh, and we must prove that our model isn't a relic of history. It's the single best way to realize the promise of our future. So that quote, you know, uh, when you, you really think about Beijing's dirty little secret, <laughs> which is that Xi Jinping has been describing the competition with the United States in precisely such ideological terms for years in his, in his uh, internal speeches. If you take, for example, a key passage from uh, General Secretary Xi's seminal speech, which was kept secret for six years, uh, but which he delivered to the Communist Party Central Committee on the 5th of January, 2013. He said, quote, there are people who believe that communism is an unattainable hope, or even that it is beyond hoping for, that communism is an illusion. Facts have repeatedly told us that Marx and Engels' analysis of the basic contradictions in capitalist society is not outdated, nor is the historical materialist view that capitalism is bound to die out and socialism is bound to win. This is an inevitable trend in social and historical development, but the road is torturous. The eventual demise of capitalism and the ultimate victory of socialism will require a long historical process to reach conclusion." Uh, close quote. So the Biden and the C quotations are almost mirror images of, of, of each other. And President Biden's quotation is, in effect, kind of a, a belated American rejoinder to Xi Jinping's secret call for the defeat of capitalism and democracy. And, and Xi made that speech during President Obama's first term. Uh, so we, we're, we're catching up <laughs> to, to where, uh, uh, where Beijing has already been for quite some time now. Uh, American intellectuals and business lobbies have long resisted casting U.S.-China relations as an ideological struggle. Uh, President Biden's guidance, like Xi Jinping's, makes clear, however, that as far as policy is concerned, this matter is already settled. The ideological dimension of the competition with China is inescapable, and it might actually even be central. President Biden's guidance also signals that while his tactics are going to deviate from the Trump administration's, uh, there's so far a significant degree of continuity in U.S. strategy. And I think that's reflective of the bipartisan consensus on China that finally emerged over the past few years. So it's no wonder then that Beijing is focusing its influence activities on other segments of American society, uh, the U.S. business community in particular, but also state and local governments here in the United States. Beijing knows that its influence efforts at the federal level are increasingly in vain. For the first time in decades, Chinese diplomats are facing resolve rather than accommodation on Capitol Hill and in two successive administrations in the White House. So what should American CEOs do about that? Uh, first, I think they need to come to grips with how much the situation has changed over the past few years and that this change seems unlikely to be rolled back. CEOs are going to find it increasingly difficult to please Washington and Beijing at the same time. Uh, President Biden's strategic guidance flatly states that, quote, we will ensure that U.S. companies do not sacrifice American values in doing business in China, close quote. Meanwhile, Chinese leaders, as I mentioned at the start, are using uh, or really issuing high decibel warnings to multinationals that Western values are unwelcome if companies want to do business in China. So like sailors straddling two boats, American companies are likely to get wet. And one prudent step for CEOs to take uh, would be reviews uh, of how the new geopolitical reality impacts their corporate enterprise risk management on both sides of the Pacific. And the great power competition with China has really introduced a thicket of new regulatory, fiduciary, and reputational risks that corporations here are only just beginning to wake up to. Uh, Beijing's intensifying use of extrajudicial tools also add a layer of personal security risk that companies need to weigh more heavily. 
uh, Beijing's taking as hostages uh, uh, two Canadian businessmen, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spabor is, is a good case in point. But another prudent step would be to draw up contingencies for diversifying uh, supply chains. Uh, the, the rush to concentrate so much of the world's manufacturing on the east coast of the People's Republic of China uh, in recent decades really was an aberration and it was an unsustainable one. Now, no one in Washington is seriously threatening a wholesale decoupling of the two economies. That's a straw man argument uh, put forward mainly by Chinese propagandists and a, and a handful of alarmists here at home. But decoupling in a more limited variety particularly on key technologies, is already well underway. In the Trump administration, we've referred to this as selective decoupling. And I've noticed that some Biden administration officials use the term managed decoupling. Uh, Senator Tom Cotton and uh, some others on Capitol Hill have adopted the term targeted decoupling. So when you have so many different voices using such similar terminology, it's a sign that CEOs need to pay attention. Now, I, I said I'd close my remarks with a comment about the mindset that I think we need to adopt uh, in order for American democracy to pass uh, the biggest geopolitical test of the 21st century, as uh, Secretary Blinken put it. Uh, a favorite metaphor in Beijing and in Washington is that our, our two countries are running in a marathon and only one contestant is going to prevail uh, above all the others. And, and it's a fine metaphor. Uh, but let me, let me submit that right now, we're actually in a 400 meter dash that we must win in order to qualify for the next leg of the marathon. If over the next four years, we fail to set the right conditions with bold affirmative policies, we could put ourselves on track to lose the marathon, though we might not realize it until several years down the road. So above all, that's gonna require us to consider in every policy we adopt, every bill we introduce and every public-private partnership that government and U.S. industry undertake, we have to consider whether each initiative increases American leverage in this competition or surrenders leverage to a hostile dictatorship in Beijing. The balance of the leverage, we should never forget, is heavily in our favor. It's really up to us to keep it that way. And Beijing knows that it's in a sprint right now too. It knows better than anyone else that the advantages of a centrally planned system are fleeting and that the economic shortcomings of such a system, including waste, bureaucratic inertia, and the unforgivingly magnified consequences of each miscalculation will start to show before too long if they aren't showing already. So Beijing is really trying to engineer victory in the mind of a single leader while free societies like ours, by contrast, harness the human spirit, and therein lies our advantage. So thanks for letting me make uh, those opening remarks, and I look forward to uh, the conversation. Thank you, Matt, for those great remarks. Now we turn to the discussion portion of our program. Elizabeth Economy is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and, and at the Council uh, on Foreign Relations. She is widely acclaimed as an expert on China's domestic and foreign policy and has published too many to count articles and books on those subjects, including in 2018, The Third Revolution, Xi Jinping, and the New Chinese State. H.R. McMaster is the Fuad and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Bernard and Susan Leotod Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute at Stanford University, as well as a lecturer at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. He was the 26th National Security Advisor to the President and served a distinguished 34-year career in the U.S. Army before retiring at the rank of Lieutenant General, and somehow he also found, found time in there to be a history professor. So Liz, the floor is yours. Thank you, Glenn. And let me uh, add my welcome to you, Matt, uh, because it's really just terrific to have you join us here uh, at Hoover as a visiting distinguished fellow. So you and HR, of course, as well, uh, when he was um, National Security Advisor, I think really affected uh, a reset of our China policy. Uh, you know, people talk about resetting Russia policy, but you guys, without using that word, actually reset it. And I want to come back uh, throughout our discussion to talk about what you think you did right, what you maybe missed or would have done differently, uh, what you would still like to do. But just because uh, Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan uh, appears they're going to meet next week um, with uh, Yang Jitcher and Wang Yi, 
Um, let, let me start, uh, since you talked a little bit about the Biden administration, with asking you, what is it that you think they want to get accomplished uh, in this first meeting? Uh, or what should they uh, try to get accomplished in this first meeting, just two months after they've uh, come into office? Yeah, so you know that's that's a good question for them. I I would say that um, that a meeting like this, this early in the administration, at a time when um, it's very clear that uh, our, our attempts to engage with Beijing have been uh, uh, have been fruitless for so long, I, I I would I would use a meeting like this simply to set the terms of engagement going forward. In other words rather than have it be a particularly substantive um, uh, agenda uh, to, to basically say these are the things that need to be addressed for us to have a substantive agenda. And, uh, and there's, a, there's an, a pretty long list of grievances on our side, I think, that would need to be addressed. Uh, I, I haven't seen any indication uh, from Beijing, either over the course of the four years of the Trump administration or in the first 50 days of the Biden administration, that they intend uh, to change their course in any way uh, uh, in order to have better relations with the United States. Uh, and so um, I, I, think, I think their actions uh, speak loudly and we should uh, be judging based on their actions. So let me just quickly ask before I give HR his, his first turn, um, otherwise I'll just monopolize the entire conversation. Um, so let me just, what, what would those maybe two or three terms uh, that you sort of suggest, what would they look like if you were sitting uh, in their seat right now? What would you want to get out of the meeting? Well, I, uh, for starters, we've got uh, several Americans who are being held hostage in China. Uh, these are um, uh, American citizens who committed no crime in China, but who are, have been put under what's euphemistically called an exit ban. In other words, they're, they're trapped in China. In some cases, they're trapped in hotels in China. Uh, because Beijing wants to use them as collateral uh, to force uh, relatives, in some cases distant relatives, uh, to, to come back and face uh, the, the party uh, security apparatus. Uh, I, I would start with the release of American hostages. I would also ask for the release of uh, Canadian hostages, Michael Spavor, Michael Kovrig, who I mentioned, who are being uh, held literally as, as human collateral uh, uh, neither of them have, have committed anything uh, e even uh, nominally <laughs> uh, approximating a, a, a crime or misdemeanor in China. Um, uh, I, 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 would, I would certainly start there. I think there's a long, <laughs> a long uh, list of other things that, that uh, we would lay out. Remember, I mentioned that China just laid out a 14-point set of demands to the Australian government um, maybe the United States should have its own uh, 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 list of 14 disputes or 14 demands that we would put down as a, and, and, and need to see significant progress on as a prerequisite uh, for having any kind of substantive uh, engagement. Hey, Matt, it is, gr it is great to see you, and I'm so glad you're at, at Hoover. And, uh, and, and to be here with Liz now, I think if Hoover is, is, you know, is to the, the Lakers uh, organization, <laughs> in terms of think tanks that that uh, that are that are coping with this competition with China, I think uh, you and Liz are the equivalent of LeBron James and Anthony Davis. So it's really it's really good to have the two of you here um, to to help us cope with this very important competition. And I, I, there's nobody, Matt, who's had more of an impact, I think, on affecting that real shift, uh, as you as you mentioned, in in mentality and mindset. Uh, on the competition with China that, than you did in your in your distinguished service within the Trump administration. So great to see you. Hey, I'd like to pick up on a couple of the themes in your talk. One is, you know, that, that China does have some significant weaknesses, and you listed a couple of those. But it occurs to me, Matt, that that Wall Street in particular is slow on the uptake in connection with this competition, and in some ways is compensating for those weaknesses. Uh, it, by you know, with with massive investments in China that cover for a lot of their poor economic decisions, economic decisions they take to advance their strategic interests. So I'll just point out that that foreign direct investment uh, uh, in China exceeded that of, of foreign direct investment in the United States, for example, just in, in recent months. Would you comment on that? And how do you see Wall Street's perception of China? What has to change? And, and do you think it's possible to adjust kind of the incentives that, that are driving 
these massive investments uh, in, in China? No, it's, it's a great question. I, there, there's no doubt that Wall Street right now is an outlier in the United States. Uh, it's a big outlier, <laughs> but in a consequential one, but it is an outlier. When you've got a, a consensus, it might be the only consensus we have in Washington, D.C., uh, b- between uh, both parties in both the executive branch and in the legislature that we've got a major problem with China and that we've got to be um, uh, uh, bringing a, a whole of society uh, approach to, to combating uh, uh, Beijing's aspirations. Um, it, it, it says that that all of this passive investment that's taking place uh, in the form of index funds and things like that, where, where Wall, Wall Street is basically taking the passive uh, pension savings of, of unsuspecting Americans and funneling them by the hundreds of billions of dollars into companies, including Chinese military affiliated companies, uh, including Chinese companies that have been sanctioned by the US government for human rights violations, uh, including the, the concentration camps in Xinjiang. Uh, 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 it, it, it's a sign that there's something amiss there. And so what we tried to begin doing under the Trump administration was to start, as you put it, to, to, to realign the incentives and the disincentives. Um, the, the National Security Advisor, Robert O'Brien, and the National Economic Counselor, Larry Kudlow, wrote a joint letter uh, last year First to the Federal Pension Board that manages the pensions of you know federal workers and U.S. Marines and sailors and airmen, and said, "Why is it that you are about to shift our, our, our military members' money into Chinese military companies that are developing the capabilities to kill those same pensioners?" <laughs> and and that led to a suspension by the the uh, thrift savings. Uh, plan board. Uh, it, they, they suspended their plans to go forward with investing in China. The next step that was taken was two executive orders by President Trump uh, to, to, to say that American uh, uh, U.S. persons can no longer invest and actually are required to divest from a, from a blacklist of uh, Department of Defense designated companies that are affiliated with or controlled by the People's Liberation Army, along with their subsidiaries. So uh, right now, uh, that that policy is under review by the Biden administration. I certainly hope they continue with it. This is a, a really critical area where we've got a massive advantage. There, there, are, there is no capital market in the world that comes close to uh, the weight of the U.S. market. The U.S. capital markets or more than the rest of the world's combined, including Shanghai and Shenzhen uh, and Hong Kong for that matter. So uh, Beijing is using this loophole to, to pull passive money unsuspectingly from pension funds through these complicit uh, index funds uh, to, to, to uh, as you put it, compensate for the very serious problems uh, uh, with their economic system. Yeah, thanks. Hey, I'd like to make just a, a one last question for to actually to both Liz and to Matt. You know, what, what, there's been some speculation that that China will try to entice the United States. The Chinese Communist Party officials will, uh, with the promise of cooperation on really important global issues associated with with climate change, for for example. Liz, you've 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 done the seminal work really on China and and pollution and their you know their their environmental policies or lack thereof and. And I'd like to just ask you what your assessment is, Liz, and then and then Matt, if you would comment on that as well. Is is there an element of your advice to the administration of do not fall for it, it being false promises of cooperation in areas they know we care about, uh, that that could result in in us really vacating some of the competitive space that we've just recently re-entered. I'll, I'll be quick and say, um, look, I I hope we can find some areas of of cooper- of genuine cooperation. You know. Um, if we can, you know, both agree that we should be supporting, you know, green technology in Africa as opposed to China's export of coal-fired power plants, I'm all for that. What I am not in favor of is any sign that we would trade out on other critical issues in order to somehow garner cooperation on climate change. I mean, Xi Jinping has presented himself as a leader, right, on global climate change. He stood up there and said, you know, we are the defenders because let's just acknowledge the fact that the Trump administration pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement or started the process, which in my opinion was a mistake, but one of the few that uh, that it made uh, with regard to our our standing there. 
But um, I, I'm just not, I don't, I don't want to see us, you know, make that kind of mistake. Uh, you know, China needs to do the right thing uh, because it is the right thing. And if it doesn't do the right thing, then we should bring the uh, pressure to bear from the international community and shame it into doing the right thing. So no trading off on other issues, but I'm not opposed to trying to find common ground in supporting a bigger, broader climate initiative or you know, working to set targets on methane in addition to, uh, to CO2. So that's kind of how I would divide up the cooperative competitive element. Yeah, and, and, and I, uh, I, you're right, Liz, uh, and, and I agree with you. The, the, the thing that I would add as a cautionary note, because we all hope for, for areas of genuine cooperation with China, but the, a, couple of, a couple of concrete examples I'll give you um, uh, that, that um, should make us skeptical and, and, and require China to really to have to prove uh, that it's changed its tune, which I'm quite uh, skeptical of. One is that early in the administration, in the Trump administration, I, I tried to work with the Chinese government on uh, pandemic prevention. We weren't thinking specifically about uh, another coronavirus necessarily, we were thinking more along the lines of influenza and found that China was not living up to the international health uh, regulations that they're required to abide by as a member of the World Health Organization. They're supposed to share samples. Remember, most of these new flu samples traditionally have emerged from uh, Southern Chinese uh, farms. And so they have to share these new flu samples so that the, the WHO and the rest of the WHO members are able to, to, to prepare and analyze uh, those samples and their genomes. China was unwilling to, to share those samples. And I got the distinct feeling over time that they didn't want to share them precisely because they wanted to withhold it as leverage to gain political advantage on wholly unrelated topics, things unrelated to public health uh, and the safety of you know, billions of people. And so um, I, 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 would, I would give as a, as a, a second example, uh, a story that broke in the Wall Street Journal yesterday and, and it was really building on a, a story that came out of the German Marshall Fund uh, earlier than that, that Russia, China, and Iran, their security apparatuses and propaganda apparatuses are deliberately uh, uh, generating and amplifying uh, storylines around the world designed to undermine uh, people's faith in the efficacy and safety of US vaccines for COVID. So this is the Chinese government is doing that. This, it's not just some quack, it's the government. And, that's, and, and Russia's taken the lead on that. China has happily uh, amplified those narratives. So <laughs> that's yesterday. So I mean, what, how much cooperation are we, we really gonna expect when, when Beijing is deliberately uh, willing to put millions of lives at risk by undermining people's faith in vaccines? That's really depressing. Thank you, Matt. Um, <laughs> by the way, by one small you know, area. So, so let's talk about another potentially, um, you know, a really serious issue, which is Taiwan. Um, and I think, uh, you know, watching what's happened in Hong Kong uh, over the past year or more, you know, it's just been devastating, uh, I think, for all of us. Um, and certainly, I think, you know, shines a brighter light on uh, the potential, um, you know, of, of China to take some pretty serious action against Taiwan in the not too distant future. And I'm wondering, what you think the United States ought to do at this point with regard to Taiwan? There have been a lot of discussions, you know, should we have strategic ambiguity? Should we go for greater clarity? You know, what should be the level of our commitment? How do we engage our allies? What's your sort of thinking about, you know, strategically about how the United States should be, you know, assisting Taiwan at this point? Yeah, no, well, I, I think it's something we should certainly be looking at um, in, in coordination with Taiwan. Um, the question of, of, of uh, how we would respond and under what circumstances. But, but if you put that debate about strategic ambiguity versus strategic clarity aside for a second, it, it's, it's important to remember that the US has always responded, always responded when there is a strategic threat uh, uh, of coercion and military uh, coercion of Taiwan. Uh, in, in, in 1947, 1950, 51, 1957, 58, 1995, 96. Uh, and so it would be a, uh, it would be a historic aberration were the United States not uh, to come to Taiwan's defense uh, in, uh, in the event that uh, Beijing uh, 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 
attacked uh, or tried to blockade or, or take some other coercive step. Okay, but let me just push a little bit more. I, I mean, what, um, you know, Chinese military capabilities are, are growing in the region and, you know, people are talking about the potential for a massive cyber attack. You know, what, what do you see if, if you'd like a three, sort of the three steps that the United States should, should take now, maybe things we aren't doing, um, things that you wanted to do uh, to, well, to I, bolster? Yeah, substantive support. Um, is even more important than symbolic support at this stage. And that means helping Taiwan um, uh, upgrade its, uh, its uh, defensive concepts, the way that it's organized, uh, its, its forces, the way that it's organized also its entire society. Because uh, uh, one, one uh, thing that Beijing needs to bear in mind, uh, you know, in, in, in Beijing's uh, uh, fantasy, uh, a, a, a war over Taiwan would be something that would take place very quickly. It would be a fait accompli that, that would take a matter of days, maybe a couple of weeks at the outset before the United States and, and, uh, and others in the region were able to, to mount a, uh, uh, a, an effective defense. It, it, that, that, that's, that's the theory in, that they're playing with. If Taiwan society as a whole has demonstrated that it has the will, not just the military forces, active duty, but reservists, civil defense, uh, and, and, uh, and others have the will to fight for every village and every block of every city and every mountaintop, uh, th that is going to require Beijing to uh, revisit a lot of its strategic assumptions about what a war would actually look like. It could be a devastating quagmire uh, for the Chinese Communist Party uh, uh, to, uh, in any case, I, I, I wouldn't make uh, uh, the assumption that they're making that it would be quick. Uh, but things that the United States can do to help uh, support uh, Taiwan in its, in its reorganization, its armaments, they need ammunition, they need to have uh, stockpiles of uh, advanced uh, missiles and other weaponry uh, so that um, Beijing doesn't uh, think that they won't be able to be resupplied. They're already, already going to have the supplies that they need uh, to fight a, uh, a, a tough, grinding, um, uh, long-term uh, conflict uh, if, it, if it comes to that, which we certainly hope it won't. Thank you, Liz and HR, for those um, the very stimulating discussion. I want to give the audience a chance now to uh, to have its questions raised. And in particular, I want to pick a question from the audience that connects with what we were just talking about with regards to Taiwan, but certainly exceeds the scope of Taiwan. And that is, what do you think the ability of the Biden administration now is to forge closer transatlantic and trans-Pacific alliances so that we can form a more common approach to China, not just say in a security framework like the Quad or in a democracy framework like the talked about D10, but more broadly, uh, now that China's strength has grown relative to, to the United States, the costs of antagonizing China for some of the U.S.'s partners in the region are a little bit higher and their calculations may be a little bit different than they were a decade ago or even five years ago. What does that calculus look like? And from your perspective, what do you think the most effective way forward should be? Do you want me to feel that? Or... Yeah, Matt, yes, please, think? Matt. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, it's interesting when, when, um, uh, when, when I was working on the NSC staff for H.R. McMaster and then uh, John Bolton and, and Robert O'Brien after him, we progressively reorganized the NSC so that there were people responsible for every region of the world in the context of our competition with China. So, so for Europe, for Latin America, for the Middle East, and Africa, there were China experts uh, who were engaging with our partners on all of those continents and all of those regions uh, to ensure that they understood what, what our assumptions were, uh, that they had the benefit of, um, uh, of the knowledge of all of the, the processes that we went through in crafting our own strategy, so that as those countries began to consider strategies of their own, and they did, many, many of them followed uh, suit, with their own strategies. Europe in early 2019 put out that, that uh, uh, rather stunning statement that China is, uh, uh, they've recognized for the first time is a systemic rival uh, of, uh, of Europe that's, and, and that it's putting forward alternative models of governance, uh, totalitarian uh, uh, governance. So 
so for, for several years now, we've had very good working relations with our partners in Europe uh, up to a pretty senior level, um, uh, talking about the things that we need to, to do together. I, I think that, that the more, that, the closer you get to the grassroots, uh, I mean, when you really get to the people and popular opinion in Europe, the more you see alignment with, uh, with uh, US policy and, and assumptions and also with the sorts of, of steps uh, that they believe that we need to undertake, even if some of them are costly, they're not going to be nearly as costly as people fear, uh, frankly. We proved that during the Trump administration. Uh, but it's when you get to the, into the uh, stratosphere of uh, b business lobbies uh, in with very senior bureaucrats who are used to, in fact, they have the muscle memory of helping uh, uh, promote closer trade and investment ties with China over the last 25 years, uh, that's where you see some um, uh, static. And, and frankly, uh, those bureaucrats and even elected officials are out of tune and out of step with their own people. If you talk to members of the European Parliament, you hear a very different story that's much more akin to everything that we're talking about today about China than you hear uh, sometimes uh, in, in uh, uh, in, in uh, you know the trade ministries and finance ministries of some of these countries. Europe is coming in the same direction that we are already. They're about 18 to 24 months behind us, but they're moving in the same direction, same heading, same speed. So I think there's a huge opportunity for the Biden administration uh, to, keep, to keep leading on that front. And it should lead. Sometimes leading means that you're out ahead of the group. If you wait to hold hands with everybody in lockstep and jump together, uh, you, you, you may not make uh, that big of a splash. Sometimes you have to get out in front. Europe will follow. They are following. And uh, uh, I think it'll be useful for that uh, to be uh, borne in mind. Thank you, Matt. Just last week, um, I think the National Security Commission on AI issued a very important report um, led by um, Eric Schmidt, formerly of Google. I wonder if you could comment on the U.S. technological competition with China and the challenges China poses to U.S. national security and economic leadership in this domain, not just AI, but semiconductors, telecom, and other areas. And what progress you think has been made in the last four years and what your priorities for, uh, for U.S. policy would be going forward? forward. Yeah. So, uh, you know, with, with 5G is a useful example to talk about because we, we woke up late to the whole idea. We were very complacent, happy with our 4G phones and, and, our, and our telecom networks were making good money uh, w without having to invest in, in the future uh, uh, sorts of technologies. And we woke up late to the fact that, that Huawei, which had benefited from uh, intellectual property that had, had obtained through ver their various means. I refer you to the Department of Justice on that. Uh, and, and also through about $120 billion, according to the Wall Street Journal, in subsidies from the Chinese state, had, had gone out ahead and almost made the idea uh, of, of a world dominated by Huawei and 5G networks a fait accompli. Uh, we weren't willing to accept that fait accompli. And so we uh, took steps along with our allies uh, to make sure that, um, uh, that uh, Chinese telecom makers did not have access to our networks uh, uh, in 5G uh, because of the national security implications. Remember, what they're really after at the end of the day is not just market share, they're after our data. They want access to our most sensitive corporate, government, and personal data. Uh, that's, that's what this is all about. That's why the subsidies have been flowing to these companies. So we, we, had, we, we took those defensive steps. We educated our partners and allies. In, in cases where partners and allies were slow to come around, um, we, we went a step further with the Commerce Department last year when we put forward two rules that basically banned American semiconductors and semiconductor technology from being um, uh, purchasable, even indirectly, by uh, Chinese telecoms makers. That ended up um, completely changing the, the dynamic. It seized the initiative. It, it forced uh, this, this uh, uh, supposedly unstoppable behemoth national champion of China uh, into a defensive crouch. Uh, and it's actually now uh, creating incentives for the, the market to reassert itself. The market had been kneecapped 
by, by this very non-market set of, uh, of uh, factors that were at play. Now the market is starting to reassert itself. You're seeing investment in uh, equipment manufacturing again. There's a lot more that we need to do to, to, to spice up those incentives. Uh, and, and then in the area of software, we're already ahead, uh, even on 5G, we're well ahead of Huawei. If you, if you crack open a piece of radio access network gear from Huawei, 93% of the components are from Europe, the United States, and Japan, okay? So it's not that we don't have the technology or that they've, got, they've figured out uh, technological advances. They have not. What they've done is they've marshaled all of the, the uh, elements of state power to, to, to put this into a sort of a vertical stack and then to go out and, and lend money at non-commercial rates to foreign governments to, to require them to buy Chinese gear. So, so that's what this is about. We now need to, to replicate that model in semiconductors, machine learning and AI. We certainly can't cede any ground on quantum and on our significant edge on quantum in, in the genetics and, uh, and uh, biotech space, same thing. They have a similar project it's approach that, that Huawei took that China has a state champion that comes in and, and tries to uh, heavily subsidize their genetic sequencing uh, devices from being used because ultimately, again, they don't just want market share for the sake of, of commercial market share. They want the genetic data from every human uh, population around the world so that they can have advances uh, and monopolize uh, gene therapy drugs and, and, and also to use for more nefarious purposes. Thanks. Um, one of the problems that arises in confronting China uh, and defending United States national interests vis-a-vis -vis China, but also Russia, is this notion of gray zone competition, that we're not competing in the traditional uh, terms of military to military competition, but now there's an entire sphere of asymmetrical warfare and areas of competition that don't respond to more traditional deterrence theory. Uh, for, a, for a while, for example, the cyber command strategy of defending forward seemed to be um, doing very, very well. But in the last several months, the United States has been slammed by a series of massive cyber attacks, in particular, of course, the solar winds hack, um, but much more recently, the presumptively or attributed uh, attack by China on Microsoft Exchange services. Um, what do you think US policy should be and the response should be to those most recent attacks? And do you think any adjustments with respect to deterrence and defending forward are called for? Um, going forward. Yeah, so it, it's interesting. The, 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 the one step that the Obama administration took at the end of, of uh, his time in office, I think it was in 2015, President Obama uh, and his team got fed up with uh, many of the Chinese cyber hacks in, in particular. And so he signed an executive order, which gave him the authority to sanction Chinese companies that benefit from the theft of, uh, of uh, stolen uh, American intellectual uh, property. I, I think that was a very good move. That executive order has never been exercised. The Trump administration took other steps um, in, the, in the form of, you know, we took you know, hundreds of, of steps designed to impose costs on China, um, including indicting, uh, and in some cases jointly indicting with, with 12 other countries uh, announcing indictments of specific companies and actors that were involved in, in, uh, in Chinese cyber penetrations of our networks. But we, we haven't used the, uh, the, the President Obama's EO to actually impose costs on, on China's economic actors, not just the security apparatus that's stealing, but, all, but the companies that have benefited from the fruits of that theft. I think that that's an important area where we need to get really aggressive and we need to get really coordinated uh, with uh, our Indo-Pacific uh, allies, as well as our European and, uh, and other North American friends and partners. Thanks. Um, we have a question coming in regarding U.S. academic cooperation with China. The Trump administration has certainly um, put a focus on the uh, challenges that U.S. universities and our research enterprise in general face when coping with China, um, particularly because it has a state-directed policy of technology transfer and is very assertively trying to dominate particular fields in which the U.S. has established leadership. Um, what do you think um, U.S. policy towards um, uh, managing academic exchanges with China should be? Have we struck the right balance? And in particular, another questioner asks, 
know, how has this changed the larger atmospherics for Asian Americans and Chinese Americans in the United States who are feeling anti-Asian discrimination and some blowback from the measures that, that uh, Congress and the executive have taken to, uh, to confront China and to compete more effectively against China? How do we strike the right balance in both of those spheres? Yeah, those are great questions. I mean, starting with the last one first, um, we were we took great care to always differentiate between the regime in Beijing, the single party dictatorship of the Chinese Communist Party on the one hand, and the Chinese people, the Chinese nation, Chinese culture, Chinese history uh, on the other hand. Uh, we, uh, we view all of the latter category as our allies uh, in, in this competition. Uh, not our adversaries. And so uh, when discrimination uh, appears, as I, and I've, I've read about cases recently, um, we have to call it out uh, uh, loudly uh, and, uh, and beat it back. Uh, that is, and, and I would say that um, Beijing has rather cynically tried to play up those divisions or, or even foment uh, that kind of um, uh, 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 discrimination in our society. We've got to call that out as well. Just cast a bright, hot spotlight on it and, uh, and, and not allow people, including Beijing, to conflate uh, the idea of, of uh, Chinese Americans or the Chinese people who are Chinese nationals as, as being uh, somehow the target of our ire. They are not. When um, we looked at the problem of uh, researchers who were there in, in our labs, clearly for the wrong reasons, um, we, we decided to take a step that narrowly, surgically, uh, made it more difficult for researchers from a certain pedigree, PLA-affiliated researchers, researchers that are affiliated with uh, PLA research universities that have, have shown a, a long pattern of, um, uh, of sort of malign influence and, and intent to uh, steal uh, intellectual property. Also, uh, Chinese researchers who are obligated by contract to the Chinese government to bring back uh, all of their intellectual property. They, many have signed those contracts un under uh, the terms of some of their talent recruitment uh, programs and, and some of their scholarship programs. And so we very carefully analyzed all of that, worked with FBI and our intelligence community, the Department of Defense, and also with, uh, with the academic community to um, adopt a, a uh, policy that, that probably removed about 1% of the uh, students. Uh, and remember, China is the largest, about half of the foreign students in the United States are, are from China. Uh, 370,000 at the undergraduate and above level, another 70 or 80,000 at the high school level. Uh, it, 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 was, it was only a few thousand out of that uh, 450,000 uh, who were uh, no longer welcome uh, for, to, to uh, apply for U.S. visas or to be granted U.S. visas under the policy that we undertook. Now, I, I point to another statistic, and I saw this with the uh, Assistant Attorney General uh, at the Department of Justice who handles national security matters, made a comment the other day that uh, when the United States Department of Justice uh, uh, made arrests, um, of a handful of Chinese researchers who were here under false pretenses, false identity. They were actually PLA affiliated researchers working in sensitive labs, but they had not disclosed that as they were supposed to. When we made those arrests and also closed down the Houston consulate where there were a lot of malign activities uh, taking place, China proactively uh, withdrew, according to the Department of Justice, about a thousand more of its undercover uh, researchers. So it, it shows you that that taking proactive steps, accepting a certain amount of risk in the U.S.-China relationship uh, is something that's worth doing. It, it actually forces China to move, go onto the defensive and, and, and not to have such an easy, complacent time uh, putting uh, uh, malign actors, which are a small minority, uh, uh, into our labs.
You know, at the federal level, the Trump administration and under your leadership um, and Congress have both uh, done a great deal to raise consciousness about the challenges that engagement with China poses and about recalibrating the new terms of engagement with China. But what needs to be done at the state and local level still? Is that the weak underbelly of the United States? I um, wonder what you think the priority should be there. Yeah, what Beijing thinks it's the, the weak underbelly. That's why they've organized their, their embassies and consulates to have a very significant portion of their staff focused on what they call subnational affairs. Uh, we don't really have an equivalent for that in, 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 our, in, in our embassy in Beijing. Uh, we, our, our, our diplomats aren't even granted very much access uh, to Chinese companies and, and universities anymore. Uh, there are even whole provinces that they're not allowed to visit. Meanwhile, uh, China's task organized its, its diplomats to go try to influence um, through what they call united front work, influence city governments and legislatures at the state level and, and governor's offices to try to undermine or create um, uh, incentives that are at odds with the federal consensus that I described in my, my set remarks. Uh, Beijing is going to try to do this all the more because they're having such a hard time uh, uh, advancing their, uh, their policies uh, in, on Capitol Hill in Washington or, or uh, uh, in, you know, in the West Wing in Washington. But um, uh, it, it really requires um, some kind of proactive education. Those kinds of activities were undertaken. I know that um, uh, uh, Senator Warner did, did a lot of great work in partnership with Bill Evanina, who was our top counterintelligence uh, officer. They, they were traveling around the country talking to business leaders, which is the other soft underbelly, as we've discussed, and, but also with, with state and local officials. That kind of activity needs to be more systematized uh, and, um, uh, and more routine. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, HR, and thank you, Liz, for really wide-ranging and very, very rich discussion. Um, I, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't invite all of you in the audience to uh, attend our next uh, speaker event in the CGSP speaker series. Um, that will be on April 13th at 9 a.m. Pacific. Sarah Cook, Research Director for China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan at Freedom House, will be uh, previewing her pathbreaking work on China's battle for global public opinion and media influence. Thank you very much for joining us today. And for those of you who did not catch all of it, this will be up on YouTube in a few days. Thank you. Have a great day.